Well, welcome. This is a wonderful full house, which of course, as me and Seal most definitely deserves. Um, Wen Chin Yang, who's there, and I started this series of Arabic poetry and stories in translation workshops and public readings about two years ago. And um, Yasmin has actually been once before, which is a great treat, but she came in her wearing her poetry hat. Um, and she gave us a wonderful exploration of her two-handed translations of Ibn Arabi with Robin Merger. And she's come back now as a translator of the Complete Arabian Nights, um, which she is in, in, in the moment embarked upon. Um, you can actually see some of her work online at the Sultan's Seal. She's recently published Aladdin, which is, as it were, the first installment of her Arabian Nights translation. That one was from the French. That came out with Norton uh, last, just recently. Last year. Yes, last year. And um, we have just had, some, some of us here, have just had the most wonderful treat hearing her work in progress on the Arabian Nights and the Quarter and the Three Ladies of Baghdad, which really was an astonishing experience. Scheherazade. Mm. And so now we have a very, very good fortune of hearing her give a talk. Do you have a title? Yes. Her Own Devices. Thank you. Thank you. When you are alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices, you let yourself linger in a past stacked among your pillows. You may have recognized the first line of Claudia Rankin's Citizen. I find it beguiling. It seems to promise a kind of truth plainly told, stripped of artifice and embellishment, but it does so in language that is itself highly poetic. The play on the word device is not the only device in a line that pretends to do away with them. There is also the address to a you, conjuring a reader, or if you is a veiled I, creating a distance between the speaker and her own experience. It's a tricksy line about the tricksiness inherent in art. When you are alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices, Citizen begins already exhausted and proceeds to add to this exhaustion the labor of its own artistry its restless hybrid form, poetry, commentary, lyric essay, visual art, frequent quotation, responding to the endlessness and unresolvedness of its subject, the pervasive racism of American life. The line seems to say that no matter how starkly we might speak of, about stark and urgent things, the starkness is itself always a contrivance. There is no such thing as plain speaking. We live in language. We can't get out from under language and its tricks. Devices, tricks, they're double-edged things. They name what we are taken by but can't quite trust. They sound like maneuvers, evasions, a getting out from under something. But what would it mean exactly to turn off our devices? And is it a good idea? Rankin's line also implies that doing away with device, as well as being impossible, is a dangerous thing to do. It would leave us too exposed. We have our devices for a reason. This idea that device might be a defense has been on my mind as I translate The Thousand and One Nights. One of the complicated things about the nights is that it's not exactly a book. It's more like an organizing principle. The heart of that principle is fear. The earliest surviving evidence we have of a work by that name is a receipt from a Jewish bookseller in 12th century Cairo recording the loan of something called El Flela Walela, 1,000 Nights and One Night. The receipt has survived because of the medieval Jewish belief that anything written in Hebrew script, even a receipt, was sacred and therefore could not be destroyed even long after the text had served its purpose. For over a thousand years, the Jews of Cairo kept every word they wrote, religious and secular, poetic and personal, and buried it all in a cemetery, or Geniza. 
excavated in the 19th century, the Cairo Geniza is considered the largest and most diverse collection of medieval writing in the world. What was loaned? We have a receipt and a title, but no text. The book itself, written in Arabic, not in Hebrew, earthly, not divine, was not buried and has been lost. Or rather, it went the way of all human speech. It was subject to change, censorship and embroidery, misremembrance and adaptation. Whatever it may have meant in 12th century Cairo, the Knights has never been a stable thing, has never stopped changing shape. It's a loose collection of stories without an author, altered and passed on over the centuries by editors and compilers, translators and scribes, each of whom has enhanced and cut and shaped it. No one can agree on what the Knights is. Are there 40 stories or 200? Which ones are authentic? What does that even mean? Its earliest incarnation was already a reworking of a Persian text, which itself adapted material from India, China, and elsewhere. From the beginning, the Knights has been in perpetual translation. But if it is not stable, what is it? What makes the Knights the Knights? The stories may shift, they may have lost their authors, but they have a common narrator, Shahrazad. A story becomes a knight's story because this woman has told it. Many versions have proliferated in the last thousand years, sometimes in radical conflict, but everyone agrees that the knights begin and are held together by the framing story of Shahrazad. This will be familiar to many of you, so I'll summarize it briefly and read a bit from my translation. Two brothers, Shahriyar and Shahzaman, rule over separate kingdoms until one day one decides to visit the other. Shah Zaman leaves at night, but realizes on the way that he's forgotten something at home, a talismanic charm or amulet, according to some versions, and turns back to find his wife in bed with a cook. He kills them both and continues his journey. When he arrives, his brother Shahriyar immediately organizes a hunting trip for them to go on together, but the man who has just killed his wife is in a bad mood and stays home instead. Home alone and glumly looking out the window, he sees his brother's wife in the garden, sleeping with not one but a whole group of servants and instantly feels much better. <laughs> Here's the text. And his heart lifted and he thought, this is our common lot. My brother, king and master of the world though he may be, is not safe from attack, even from his women and his wife. Disaster lurks at home. What is my own sadness next to this? I believed that only I had suffered, but now I know that we all suffer, I less than my brother. And he wondered at the ways of fate, the turns of fortune none escapes, and he forgot his cares. And when the time for dinner came, he ate with relish, drank with zest, and the better he felt, the greater pleasure he took in the feast until his only thought was, I am well. And for 10 days he feasted, and at his brother Shahriyar's return, he greeted him all smiles, high on a cheerful mood. And they sat together talking until night. And when the food was brought, they ate and drank, none with more delight than Shah Zaman. And as he ate and drank, his heart grew lighter, color, pale, color pinker, sorrow paler, and his blood ran faster. He was fatter now, himself again, and better. And Shahriyar who could not help but see his brother change, kept it to himself until one day, do me a favor, he said, and tell me the truth. What truth, said Shah Zaman. You were gaunt when I left you, brother, wasting away, utterly changed, so weak and pale, I thought it must be for home that you ached, but I said nothing. The worse you looked, the less I said, and left you alone to go hunting. But now that I am back, I find you full of vigor, eating with hunger, and I want to know what was the matter. And what made the color return to your cheeks? And Shah Zaman, eyes to the ground, replied, I cannot tell you what it was that made me better. And his brother, burning to know, said, tell me first why you were pale. And Shah Zaman related what had happened with his wife the night he left from start to end. And while I was with you, he said, I could not turn my thoughts from what I'd seen. That is the reason for the change you saw. And the king shook his head in wonder at the tricks of women and sought refuge in God from their harm. 
And he said, brother, you did well to kill your wife and her lover, and you had every reason to give in to grief. I dare say what happened to you has happened to no other man. And if I were you, I would have killed a hundred women or a thousand. I would have gone mad. And he gave thanks to God for the change in his brother and asked him again for the cause. I wish, said Shah Zaman, you wouldn't ask, but I must know. I fear you will be thrown into worse grief than mine. Go on. He tells his brother, who also reacts with murder, Shahriyar, to resolve the problem of a woman being a person, decides to take a new wife every night and have his vizier kill her in the morning. He does this until there are almost no women left. Now the vizier who had the women murdered had two daughters of his own, the elder Shahrazad and the younger Dunyazad. And Shahrazad had read a lot of books, science and philosophy, knew poetry by heart, had studied history and myth and the wisdom of kings, and she was practiced at clear thinking and full feeling and close reading. And one day she said to her father, let me tell you what is on my mind. What is on her mind is to marry the king and end the massacre. Her wild gamble is that by telling him stories every night, she will change him, move him into another kind of response, an acceptance of what he cannot control. This is how the nights begin. A man experiences a complicated emotion and commits mass murder in response, and a woman takes on the task of talking him out of it. A talking cure, the longest and most high stakes therapy session in literature. <laughs> a bit like the Cairo Geniza, the nights is an accumulated thing, like a city grown through sprawl rather than design. It's not a book because a book has edges and can be interrupted, whereas this is a flowering of language driven by fear, a woman's ancient fear that she will be killed if she does the wrong thing. In the Odyssey, Penelope weaves a shroud for her father-in-law and unpicks it every night to keep at bay the advances of the men who have invaded her house. Shahrazad's web is made of words. She cannot undo what she has done before, cannot unsay the previous night's stories. She has to go on weaving. She is Eurydice to her own Orpheus. A slip, a hesitation, a backward glance would be her own undoing. But such a proliferation of language carries its own problem, recently articulated <coughs> by my Syrian grandmother when I told her that yes, I was still working on the nights. Mm -hmm. If I was married to someone as talkative as Shahrazad, she said, exhausted at the thought, I'd kill them. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother makes an important point. The insistence that storytelling is a seduction has to be balanced against the other fact that it is also a frustration and an annoyance. The danger of displeasing the king exists alongside that other more banal possibility that he will fall asleep. This is Tawfiq al-Hakim's version of the scene in his play of 1934. Shahrazad speaks not just to save herself, but all other women. Her project is heroic, an extreme form of performative speech. What it makes happen is nothing less than the saving of the world. The stories she tells carry no single message. Instead, they seem to demonstrate the sheer richness and diversity of experience. There are recurring themes. Women in the nights tend to be clever and resourceful, Though they are dealt a worse hand than the men, they tend to come out on top. There are many stories in praise of cunning. Marina Warner, in her completely fabulous book on the nights, Stranger Magic, has noted the paradox that so many of the stories told by Shahrazad in the nights reiterate the frame story's message that women are not to be trusted. Women's wiles, Arabic has a word for this danger, makr, no, no end. Is it a paradox? Let us look more closely at this word, makr. Let us turn to Edward Lane. Lane was not the only Englishman to take up the study of Arabic to avoid a career in the church, though he took the pursuit further than most. 
he moved to Egypt at 24 and would spend the rest of his life immersed in Arabic, producing several volumes on Egyptian life as well as translations of both the Quran and the Nights. By the end, he was so used to the cursive shapes of Arabic manuscripts that he complained that English print hurt his eyes. The last 30 years of Lane's life were devoted to the compiling of an Arabic lexicon. Less a new dictionary than a compilation of the findings of medieval Arabic lexicographers. He had arrived at the letter Qaf when he died in 1876, a fact that incidentally has prompted a superstition among lexicographers. One dictionary compiled in Germany begins with the following note. Authors of Arabic dictionaries have frequently died when writing the entries for the letter Qaf. <laughs> to make up for that problem, this dictionary begins with the letter Qaf. <laughs> In the absence of a good historical dictionary, we still rely on Lane for the histories and derivations of Arabic words and their uses in the medieval period. Under Makara, we find three definitions. One, he practiced deceit, guile, or circumvention, desiring to do another a foul, an abominable, or an evil action clandestinely. Two, he practiced an evasion or illusion a shift, an artifice, a trick, a plot, a stratagem. Three, he exercised art, craft, cunning, or skill in the management or ordering of affairs with excellent consideration or deliberation. The progression from abominable to excellent suggests that this is less a case of double meaning as it is evidence of a double standard. The entry ends with a note Makr is praised or dispraised according to the nature of its object. We have to wonder, who is allowed to be crafty? When is makr a moral failing and when is it art? There may be a gendered dimension to this. In both Arabic and European mythologies, the lovable figure of the trickster tends to be male. The crafty or wily woman has a harder time. A long tradition associates beauty itself, coded as female, with deception. The word pretty is from a root meaning trick. But just because this gendered double standard exists doesn't mean we should go along with it. Instead, we must think carefully about how to translate words like makr so that we do not unconsciously reproduce modes of thinking where men are praised for their skill and women mistrusted for their wiles when they are engaging in the same activity. I'd like to linger on one instance of Makr in one of the stories nested inside the frame tale. As you know, the knights are composed of stories nested or emboxed or embedded, literally embedded in the tales told by Shahrazad. This is the story of the donkey and the ox. A donkey and an ox are in the stable side by side when one day the ox notices the imbalance between them and turns to the donkey to complain to your health, what it must be to live in milk and honey, to be waited on and fed sifted barley and cooled with crystal water, while I am taken out to plow at night, forced to wear a thing they call a yoke around my neck, and made to work all day turning the field, driven past endurance and pushed until my sides are cut to shreds under the whip, my neck to ribbons. Oh, they work me night to night, Take me home in the dark and throw me beans dripping mud and straw laced with chaff and leave me on a bed of piss and dung while you rest on watered ground and pillows of clean hay. You live in comfort, save for the rare day our master needs you for an errand, never for long. You live in comfort when I am tired. You sleep when I am awake. A complaint about injustice, to which the donkey replies, they were not wrong to call you beasts of burden. You shoulder every load without a word. There is no side to you, no guile. You are not wise to them, nor will you listen to those of us who are. Instead, you break your back so they may lie at ease. At the first call to prayer, you are taken to the field where only pain awaits. And in the manger, tethered to your trough, you have to ram it with your horns and kick and scream and bellow for the beans until they're flung your way. Try this instead. Next time they bring you food, refuse to eat or touch it. Do no more than sniff it and withdraw. Lie on the straw, 
and you will have the sweeter life you seek and you will find relief. Here we have a donkey teaching an ox how to go on strike. <laughs> the old device of the exploited and dissatisfied as seen with particular resonance this week. And the donkey follows his advice. And in the morning, when the plowman came to set the yoke around his neck, the ox was slow to move, and under the man's blows he tried a ruse. He threw himself to earth, took another beating, but kept up his trick of tripping, every step a stumble until night. And when the plowman took him back and tied him to the trough, the ox did nothing, did not shout or stamp the ground, but drew away. And when the beans were brought, he did not touch them, but settled on the hay and fell asleep. The two lines I outline, outlined in bold are both makr in the Arabic. In the first case, there is no side to you, no guile. You are not wise to them. Makr here is presented as a form of legitimate defense against the animal's enslavement, with the implication that the failure to exercise makr in this case would be a kind of foolishness. I like the word wise for that reason, to be vigilant, to use one's wits when needed, to have one's devices on, is not only acceptable, but a form of wisdom. In the second example, under the man's blows, he tried a ruse. The Arabic here is simply thawr, the ox exercised makr. And I chose the word ruse for its earliest sense, the dodging movements of a hunted animal, which seems to me a poignant description of the knights as a whole. The knights are a long ruse. Shahrazad is employing artful means to save her life. It's also been proposed that the word ruse may derive from a vulgar Latin form of refusare, to refuse, which seems, an apt, which seems apt for what the ox is doing or rather not doing here. Shahrazad's project can be understood not only as a vindication of her sex, but also as a form of conceptual warfare. Night after night, she is stretching the bounds of makr, expanding the king's understanding of it beyond deception to include skill and ingenuity and artistic control. By embodying the contradictions of makr and making it the theme of so many of her stories, she's also teaching the king to accept the ambiguity at the heart of things. Though she never explains the stories, the structure of the work itself contains a kind of lesson. Resolution is constantly deferred, meaning withheld. It is difficult to leap to conclusions when more is always to come. The king is kept in a state of epistemological suspense. Sorry. It is sometimes forgotten that Shahrazad is telling stories to two people, not one. Her sister Dunyazad is also present. The earliest part of the knights to have survived is a small fragment from the ninth century in which Dunyazad asks her sister to tell her a story if she is not sleepy or if she is not asleep. This also happens to be the oldest fragment of literature on paper. Dunyazad herself is a device. Shahrazad has requested her presence in the bedchamber to prompt the stories out of her. The nights are pillow talk wrapped in the guise of bedtime stories. The king is cast into the role of eavesdropper on their women's knowledge. Pillow talk and bedtime stories may have different audiences, the lover and the child, but they have in common the vulnerability of their listener. Not for nothing is pillow talk a motif in spy fiction. Think of the honey trap luring confessions out of her unsuspecting bedfellow. In bed, our defenses are down, our devices turned off. The nights must be the longest work of literature entirely set in bed. And I don't think this setting is incidental. The stories happen where dreams should be and do some of the work of dreams. In the moment of falling asleep, Shahrazad is falling awake, or rather leading the king into a sleep-like state emblematic of uncertainty and mysterious knowledge. I have wanted, so to speak, to write in the dark when the mind must accept the world it witnesses by day and out of all data assemble meaning. 
This is the American poet and translator Lynn Heginian in an essay called La Faustienne, in which the figure of Faust comes to stand for the Western model of knowledge, male, egoistic, acquisitive, and is held in contrast to Shahrazad, who knows by making and who puts her knowledge to remedial use. Begun around the same time as La Faustienne and written over the course of two decades, Heginian's The Book of a Thousand Eyes was begun as a homage to Shahrazad. It is a book of what she calls night works about dreams and, to quote the poet, other kinds of nocturnal states. Not just dreams when you're really asleep, but all kinds of useless thinking that goes on when one's having insomnia, worried, jealous, envious, hallucinating, stoned, <coughs> all those altered consciousness kinds of things. Against the old idea that associates truth with waking and wakefulness, Heginian tests what night and slumber can do for knowledge and for politics. It takes sleep as activism. Because we are not innocent of our sentences, we go to bed. The bed shows with utter clarity how sentences by saying something make something. Sentences in bed are not describers, they are instigators. That's a bit of one poem and I'll read you a bit from one more. Dawn occurs and is buried. Dawn comes to bear. Dawn coming to compose. Dawn is capricious casually. It isn't clarity that causes the sun to appear at break of day. It's the hour at which I most vividly dream that I hesitate. The dawn rhapsody is drawn up and out. The light sweeps the chill cliff I'm scaling. I can speak at dawn, but at dawn the letters A through Z terrify me. In 2014, Lynn Heginian visited Australia to participate in a number of literary events. One of these was a poetry reading followed by a conversation with poet and musician Kate Fagan. Fagan began her interview with Heginian by telling her, one of the comments that came back often during morning tea was that people felt they were listening to you for five or ten minutes when in fact you'd been with us for an hour. Fagan called this illusion generated by the reading of the poems a temporal warp. This warp, this twist in the shape or perception of time, seems to reveal something important about the devices of storytelling. Storytelling is a trick, the same trick performed by sleep. We have all woken, to, we have all woken up to find ourselves unsure if an hour has passed or five. The verb to while, meaning to deceive, took on another meaning by confusion with while, W-H-I-L-E, so that by the 18th century, both while and while mean to cause time to pass without dullness. Shahrazad is playing for time by performing the same temporal warp, the same trick of causing time to pass without dullness. She must spend what remains of every night in a race against the sun until the same refrain occurs. But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. Beautifully rendered here by Matisse in one of his lithographs. The night imposes a natural constraint on her speech. We are told in the Arabic that she speaks for the last hour of every night, but the word hour, sa'a, before taking on its modern bounds of 60 minutes could also simply mean a period, a little while, an indefinite short time, and this indeterminacy only adds to the spell it could be an hour that feels like five minutes. There is a spectacular urgency to the whole enterprise, entertain or die. But what form this urgency must take is a delicate question. If Shahrazad made her fear clear, if her language had the manic desperation of her plight, she'd fall at the first hurdle. Like comedians who are also in the business of performing while trying not to die, she has to draw out her listener's vulnerability while concealing her own. You probably noticed in the passages I read from my translation that they have no full stops. This is because I wanted to find a form to match the general conceit, that these stories are a feat of performance and endurance, a marathon of memory and imagination told on a single breath every night. 
I wanted to take seriously the idea that a life is at stake, the idea of a sentence endlessly deferred. Punctuation, which is to say breath, seemed a good way to do it. I stayed up late writing this lecture. I'm delivering it now under the effect of jet lag and with the fear that I will fail or bore you or get my notes mixed up. The Book of a Thousand Eyes has been my companion through much of the work on the nights and lines from it kept floating to my consciousness as I looked for sleep. I say, be a philosopher today and tomorrow be tired. Or, our sleep has no conclusion. Sleep is as abundant as the world is incomplete. Instead of concluding then, which seems antithetical to the spirit of the nights, I would like to show you something. Not very long ago, I was in a cafe in Istanbul where I live and spotted an old book on a shelf. It was the kind of place that had clearly book th bought these books by the meter to decorate the walls. So I didn't feel too bad about asking if I could take home the volume that had caught my eye. It was a cheap edition of Edward Lane's translation of The Thousand and One Nights, the same Edward Lane who compiled the dictionary I mentioned earlier. Translators of the Knights make up a strange dynasty with strange habits. John Payne did his translation riding around London on the top deck of a horse-drawn omnibus, a fact I owe to Robert Owen, who's here today. Richard Burton plagiarized both Lane and Payne while disparaging both. Antoine Galland, the first translator, worked on the Knights only after dinner. I would like to be able to say the same. There'd be a kind of glamorous and magical symmetry to a book of the Thousand and One Nights, produced over a Thousand and One Nights, but I can't work like that. During a recent bout of insomnia, I thought I had found my chance, but my body and brain refused to go near the Word document. Like the ox of the tail, they went on strike. What I started doing instead was reading Lane's translation, the volume poached from the cafe bookshelf. And in my sleepless, half-dreaming state, words from the page would swim up at me in constellations. I started making erasure poems, blacking out portions of the text to create a new text from what remained. I'll show you three. From her lips to his bed, a thousand kings changed by one of the poets. Anxiety will not last. What struck me as I made new poems from page after page was how each page seemed to contain the whole story of the nights, as if Shahrazad had encrypted her own story in the text and even in its translations, as if she were transmitting messages about herself in invisible ink. Here's another one. Daughter and fear, blue fire, her sparks preserving our lives. This practice became another way of reading and translating the nights, adventuring through the text in zigzag paths, producing my own idiosyncratic maps, taking my cue from Borges, who said, I think, who wrote, I think that the reader should enrich what he is reading. He should misunderstand the text. He should change it into something else. And this is the last. Oh, my father, I shall no longer be killed. He came upon me and contest ensued between us and I employed against him one more potent mode. That I creature remained and continued. This seems to me the whole story of Shahrazad and her, whole, and her ruse for survival through time and change and endless multiplicity. That I creature remained and continued. Thank you.